<laughs> hey, maybe we, that's the first thing we should do. Maybe we should be talking like maybe like 110 beats per minute would be good, you know? Yeah, <laughs> really fast like a robot. <laughs> <laughs> so you can hear me hear me good on your end? Loud and clear. All right, great. So I, I'm probably going to screw it up again. How, how do you pronounce your last name? F- yeah, it's a hard one. <laughs> it, yeah, totally. Favicia. Favicia, there we go. Perfect. So it's got Vic. <laughs> yeah. Little, was, yep. <laughs> so you probably get a lot of Favicia, right? That's not, that's a good one. You, I get so many things you can't believe, you know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my last name is Tao and people, it's it's always Toe. Okay, yeah, I see it here. So it's, it's Tao, T-O-U-W. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what did you think at first? You know what? I might have said some, well, I was close. I was close for some reason, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think that O-U-W at the end kind of makes it an ow, but what it, that's just that's probably just my my belief. <laughs> yeah, the good news is though it's a shorter last name. My, when people see my thing, they're like, "Oh, there's too many things going on," you know. Yeah, <laughs> got two C's, got a V. I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> H I yeah yeah you could yeah you get like I don't know we can go either way you know. <laughs> All right, so um, John, great to have you on the podcast. Um, so the, the first thing I kind of wanted to go over, I see that you're um, a touring uh, clinician. That's correct. Yes, yes, it is. So like. I, I kind of discussed this a little bit with uh, Jason Bittner. We had him on the uh, podcast episode. How, how do you? How did you get into being like a touring clinician? Do you? Is that what you like strive to do, or was it just someone approached you like J- Jason and said, "Hey, you know, you're a pretty decent drummer. Let's get you at these places and promoting our products." How did you? How did that come about? Uh, that's a great question. I never considered myself a clinician back mm-hmm. in the day, mm-hmm. um, but I was asked to do a drum festival. This is like 2004 or 2005. It was the New Jersey Drum Festival put on by um, a great guy named Neil Garthley mm-hmm. in, Tom, in Tom's, River, New, uh, Tom's River, New Jersey. And um, great venue, all serious guys. It was a real, a real festival, 600, 600 seat theater. And so I said, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to do it. I said, you know, can I bring, since I'm, I'm in New York and you're in New Jersey, can I bring my band to do it? Absolutely. So my first clinic or slash drum festival was bringing my band, which is Dharma All-Stars, mm-hmm. to, to this drum festival. And, you know, it was such a good vibe. There were amazing drummers on it, on the festival. And I went out there, did my thing, and everybody really enjoyed it. And I was like, you know what, this, this, this clinic slash festival thing is a cool thing. Drummers love talking about drums they love good players good music i had such a great vibe from the whole thing i was like you know what this could be a really cool um other other kind of thing to do during the course of my my playing you know Mm -hmm. i'm doing all kinds of gigs let's let's add this to what i'm doing and um and see for me too like i consider myself like a band guy Mm -hmm. but then when i started to do the clinics on my own the cool thing was I was able to play my own music from my band. I played it tracks Mm -hmm. and it was pretty serious music. So I was like, this is great. I'm going out, I'm teaching drummers. I'm sponsored by all the different companies and I get to play my own music and it's like a a total win all around. So Mm -hmm. I kind of got into it. Like, yeah, I I did a festival and it went well. And then I said, this is a good venue kind of vibe. And then I started doing my own clinics Mm -hmm. and, um, and it, it, I just enjoyed it a lot, and I felt like I was – I just – I love to teach too. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was a good thing to combine, to combine my teaching mm-hmm. with the fusion band that I'm playing with. Mm-hmm. So I play to all those tracks. So, mm-hmm. um, so to long story short, I just kind of fell into it and um, loved it and then really pursued it. You know, I ended mm-hmm. up getting really into it and, and meeting a lot of people that did clinics and then people that had different um, music schools around the world and different venues and also retailers – and I'm out doing clinics all over the place, so it was a really fun thing for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I I like I really like that aspect when I watch videos and uh, you know watch like the instructional DVDs is to yep. see my favorite drummers and my favorite songs being played. You know, I I just feel like that gets me more into watching you know like an instructional video when it's my song and that's something I get into. Um, yeah. You know, seeing it when you see the drummer play it and talk through the parts, and that's so that's what you you do. You more or less go over like your band's parts and stuff like that. Well, in terms of my clinics, mm-hmm. I've, I've done hundreds of them now around the world, so I, I kind of have a format that that works for me and works for the audience. Mm-hmm. I basically um, will come out and play to some tracks that um, uh, they're definitely from my own music and my own band, which is more of the fusion end of things. Mm-hmm. 
And then when I'm done doing that, I usually te teach a lesson from my Elements Drum Method book that's out on Alfred Music. Mm -hmm. And so I do a lesson with, with the drummers, and then I do a Q&A section. And then at the end, I kind of talk about my gear a little bit, but I, don't, I try not to talk too salesy about it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm very lucky and fortunate that I'm endorsed by, like, I think 15 different, you know, company, drum companies, different parts between Sabian, Cymbals, and Yamaha Drums, and Vic Firth, and Remo, and LP, all these, these 10 of them. And um, so I add a little bit of that in the end, and, and people always want to know about the gear you're playing, so it's a good, good conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's my format. But it, it goes, either, you, know, you never know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. But I always want to my, – my number one goal is to educate mm -hmm. and also to inspire the guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the number one thing. And I kind of have a format, but it's it's kind of it, – whatever happens, happens in a way. Yeah, that's it's crazy to think that, you're, you know, you're using these products growing up. And all, basically with, with drums, it's – it's you have household names that mostly everyone uses. And and now you're you're endorsed by, you know, Sabian, Vic Firth, and Remo. It, mu it must feel pretty crazy to be – endorsed by products you've used growing up as a kid. I agree 100%. And the, and the really cool thing for me is all my favorite drummers growing up played Yamaha drums, mm -hmm. you know? And I just always loved the sound. And it was, I mean, everybody that I loved, I mean, I, that's, that's, I guess that's a little bit of a... Of a, a stretch, um, yeah. A little bit of a stretch, but mm -hmm. I listen. You know, I listen to a million guys, but my favorite guys all played Yamaha. They really did, mm -hmm. and and just that sound of the drums. So when I finally I, and I, I pursued Yamaha, I, I um, always kept them abreast of what I was doing. I was always checking in with them. I'm playing a gig here. I'm doing a clinic here. I'm in Europe playing with this artist. All the things I'm doing, mm -hmm. and eventually I got endorsed by them and that to me was just what you're saying dan i was like man this is the coolest thing in the world like you know yamaha drums i mean this is all i ever wanted to be a part of and that that i mean don't get me wrong being part of sabian and and and, and vic firth and remo and lp and and i have like tons of little guys mm -hmm. smaller companies that that aren't as big as those guys but it's amazing but the yamaha thing really meant a lot to me mm -hmm. it really did you know yeah you, you want to know it's funny me growing up i kind of stuck to the brands that I was familiar with. So I only use Zildjian and I only use Tama and Tama is a, a big part of a lot of the, the drummers. I know Um, my drum set teacher, Joe Bergamini, he used them. Uh, Jason Bittner used them, but in the studio that I practice in, um, it's called American one. They use Yamaha kits and they, they don't, they don't use anything crazy. It's just the stage custom. I think they're one of the, like the lower ends. And I have to say, I was like, you know what? I think this might be my next drum set. Cause they sound it's just like this is a lower end kit, and I'm amazed at how good they sound. I hear that all the time. And by the way, Joe Bergamini is a very close friend of mine, and I do love Tama drums. It's the only other company that I have ever played. When I was a kid, mm -hmm. I had the Tama Superstars. They mm -hmm. were unbelievable. You know, when I was a young kid. Yeah, it's a very popular, uh, oh. you know, set of theirs. Oh, they were amazing. You know, mm -hmm. I had I had the red cherry Bremers. They were amazing. You know. And, um, but I'm I'm with you on that. I hear that all the time. Even they just don't make a bad sounding drum set. No. I mean. Oh, you, they somehow they 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 push through. Now some of the drums play better than others. Mm -hmm. So exactly, you know what I mean. Like so, the lower end. But you know, these days I tune my heads pretty low to get a big fat sound. So they do feel differently. Like you know, a, a fine tuned top of the line Yamaha kit has a little bit more action, a little different feel, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, but I when I'm on the road doing clinics, I can get any Yamaha kit that's in in the drum shop or on the, anywhere. So and I've had only good experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, like like Joe always told me, I mean, not for nothing, the the head produces eighty percent of the sound. So yeah. as long yeah. as you're able to put a good head on there and tune it, you can basically make them all, you know, sound pretty decent. But I definitely agree. For some reason, it's it, even the lower ends. I hit a Yamaha kit, and they just they just sound awesome. No doubt, it's it's it, and it's it's like that. I don't know how they do, it, but that's how it is. You know. Yeah, and it's also crazy to think, yeah. Yamaha is just not a drum company. They they have pianos. They I mean obviously it's different sections of Yamaha, but they have quads. I mean that's that's for me the the where I know Yamaha from was like quads because you know the, just the people around where I live they're into dirt bikes and quads and all that. And to see my brother who's someone who's into quad and quads and not so much music see a state you know see you come home with a stand and it says Yamaha and you're like. That can't be the same brand, but it is. It's just crazy. I think they make all these things, and every it, they're top brands for for each. You know, the 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 dirt bikes and the the drums. They're Yamaha is part of it. The the top brands yeah. to use. Yeah, it's a major major company. I mean, they they make boat engines. I mean, they make a million things. It's amazing, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. 
But yeah. um, and I think we're kind of lucky as drummers because, like you said, Tama makes great kit. I honestly, I, there's just something I I fell in love with with Yamaha. But if you use Tama, if you use Pearl, if you use you know Gibraltar, you really you really can't go wrong. It's all top of the line stuff. It's all a matter of your preference and what's in your ear, what you hear, you know. Mm -hmm. And you, yes, you can tune everything in a way, but the, you know, there's certain shells and certain diameters mm -hmm. and, and the wood that's used. And again, all the hardware and the craftsmanship and the mm -hmm. bearing. It's, there's a million things and mm -hmm. and that make the drums sound great. And yeah, it's it's pretty amazing when you can just when you hear things on records that you grew up listening to that you can have on your own like that. It's mm -hmm. pretty, amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially if you you know you need an extra tom or something like that to to baby to basically get it handed to you and like let you you know use that where you don't have to scrounge up the money and and come up with it. But like like another end, you're just an, you're an advocate for the brand. You need to push it and you need to show people you know look at me. You know I'm a I'm a great drummer and this is the brand I play and you know this is the brand you should probably try out. Obviously you're not getting stuff for free. You really need to push it, but. It's just, it's a great thing that, to have. I mean, for drummers out there, obviously, if you want to be in a band, you want to be a sponsor, that's something you look forward to. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a cool privilege. And the other thing is you can't fake it. Mm -hmm. You really can't fake it. When you endorse a product, you got to love the product. It, it comes across. Mm -hmm. And um, people know in the, in the industry and fans know. I mean, you got to love it. You know, mm -hmm. when, when they see how much you really love it, that's, that's the selling point, really. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, Amazing, so, right? Yeah. So, so as for growing up, what were like your biggest? What we'll do to and do it in two sections. What were your biggest band influences? And as a drummer, what was your 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 biggest drum influences? Like Neil Peart or something like that. All right. So bands coming up. Interesting. So I I probably had the typical you know situation coming up where I like so many different bands mm -hmm. when I was young and playing different copy bands and I mean everything that you can imagine that that a lot of the drummers would play back then and, and, I, and I have to say we all loved Neil Peart that was mm -hmm. like the standard of like it just blew your mind you loved it you were mm -hmm. copying him and doing all those kind of things <laughs> and so you know but I listen it's interesting I was listening to bands when I was really really young heavy metal bands I mean, I mean, I remember playing in a band when I first started, like some, I guess, Black Sabbath songs, mm -hmm. and and then some just lighter stuff, some simple rock stuff. But when I really got serious, I, you know, I was, Neil Peart really def definitely kind of got me into saying, "Hey, man, there's a lot more to this. Listen to what this guy's doing." Mm -hmm. Then for me, um, one of the big, it's amazing that I kind of, in terms of artist or band, I was fortunate enough to 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 get turned on to Chick Corea, mm -hmm. and I got turned on the Chick Corea back when Steve Gadd was doing a lot of those those records with him. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that artist was amazing. He played every style you could imagine. And Steve Gadd, to me, was the kind of drummer that was a session guy that could play all styles very well. And mm -hmm. that was very that was very new back when I was coming up. Mm -hmm. So I had talked to my teachers. I was, you know, I, I of course was was with Dom Famulara for a long time and Jim Chapin. And I was with this guy, Joe Bonadio, who was very influential with me. And one of the things I mentioned to them was like, you know, I want to be a pro player. And they said, well, you want to be a pro? You got to basically play everything, you know, at a, at a, at a good level. Because when the phone rings, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't want to say, hey, man, say the phone rings for a Latin jazz gig in New York City. You don't want to say, well, I don't know how to play that music. You want to, you want to be together and go and make the money and go do a gig. Mm -hmm. You don't want to say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't. So I was like that session head. So I learned every style I possibly could mm -hmm. at the highest level I possibly could. And then I went into New York City and played with all these different bands and artists in every style. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, so that's kind of like my, to answer your question, back to my, my first love of an artist and a drummer kind of came together because you had this Steve Gadd who would play with, so many, you know, Paul Simon or Joni Mitchell or Chuck Mangione. And then because he was up in Rochester playing with him when he was a kid. And then all the stuff he's doing now, he's such a versatile guy. And that kind of listening to the way he was a really versatile drummer led me into these different artists that he played with. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's do you think it's hard to I mean, because obviously, like you said, you got to know all these styles and play them very well. Do you find it hard to fall in love with different styles or do you feel that you don't love all these styles and one of them particularly stands out like if you had to pick one hard rock or you know like yes. you said, that would yeah. be your favorite dan that's that's a great 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 question mm -hmm. because when i first came up i i was so intrigued by all these different styles and i loved them all because it was it was i was new at it and it was a it was a really amazing thing to be like wow 
everything I listened to, if I listened to bebop jazz, or, and I played everything, bebop jazz to big band, I was in big bands, I was doing trio stuff, I was doing R&B, I was doing smooth jazz, I was doing rock, singing a song, all these different things. And the thing was, when, when I was a little younger, I just loved learning it all because it just all sounded really amazing to me and there was a lot to learn. And, then, and the key for me was being able to go into the city and play all these styles of music. So you, of course, you know, Dan, you can practice these things, but you got to get out and play them. Yeah. That, but, so that's, that's a very important thing that I was able to do. I mean, I was getting called for gigs in New York City in the village with like serious jazz guys. And I, 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 I wasn't even at that level, mm -hmm. but they, they needed drummers. And I gave, like I was playing with Lonnie Plaxigo. The guy was a, the bass player for Jack DeJanette. The guy's insane. Mm -hmm. I'd go and play with them. And they were so nice to me. Like, yeah, man, good job. They needed me to come in. They needed me to sub. And they weren't, they never, you know, they weren't like, you know, you're not the bebop guy. They were cool with me. Like, you did a good job. Keep going. They were very encouraging, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but to go back and answer your, your, the first part of the question, which I love so much, as time goes by, your, your, um, your ear changes and, and what you really love definitely does change, Dan. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, well, I loved everything because it was all new and I, and I was very inspired. Like, even when, remember when Horatio came in and mm -hmm. Left Foot Clave and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. I thought that was really inspiring. I learned all that left foot clave and all the Cuban and Latin. I listened to every single artist and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I went out and played it. But at the end of the day, as I've been doing it a long time, which is, that's why I like your question so much, mm -hmm. is I kind of fine tune what I really actually love. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how you take everything in at first. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you kind of know what you really love. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes a little while to get to what you really want to play in your heart, you mm -hmm. know? Exactly. I mean, f for me, it's just like, I guess with the way everything's so open, you, you could basically go on Spotify and, all, and YouTube yes. and, and just find everything. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel with me, it's like hard rock and, and that that metal style. It's so easy for me to find that next band that sounds like this band that I love. I'm just right. so in tune with that style and I love that music. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I like I took lessons. So obviously I had to play different styles and stuff. When you when you bust out a you know like a jazz groove or a samba or something like that, when you first hear someone play it like very well, it it, it blows your mind. And like you said, you might not love the music. It's just when you learn something new and you're like, holy crap, I can start, I can play this this groove where my right hand's doing one thing and my left hand's just going crazy. It, it's just kind of inspiring. So you might not have to like the style, but the music and the drumming, something about it clicks with you. Yeah, and, and, and actually, back in the day, I did like the style. I loved the music. I mean, um, when I came up, there was no Spotify. I, I invested so much money into CDs. I'd go to Tower Records in New York City downtown every Sunday with a friend of mine. We'd drive into the city, and I'd buy all these different CDs of all the best artists and drummers, and I'd learn. And it's very inspiring when you're learning it and you're playing it. But then at the end of the day, just like you said, Dan, it's like there's a certain band style or a certain kind of thing that you just – naturally gravitate towards so mm -hmm. you know for me i'm really into the fusion drumming like i do in my band now and then i also really went back to my roots of playing just groove music and singer songwriter and alternative rock stuff that's where my head is these days i mm -hmm. i, I kind of bounce back and forth from the fusion thing to sing a songwriter alternative rock thing that's where i'm in right now that's mm -hmm. where my love is now of course i played a million different things and if i get called to do anything i can go out and do it mm -hmm. and i also read very well so i've done a lot of gigs where reading was a big deal where you get called to read charts and all that kind of stuff and um but yeah at the end of the day dan you're right it, it comes down to what you're really feeling now mm -hmm. you know yeah definitely so would you what would you say is like if you you're you know, obviously you do many things if you had to pick the one thing that you, as a drummer, you would rather do, would it be teaching lessons, touring as a cl uh, clinician, or being in a band, aka being a rock star, <laughs> which every drummer, obviously musician, like that's their goal, but doesn't always pan out. What would be your primary? Would it be the band, or would you feel like growing accustomed to teaching is that's something you would like to do more? I've been teaching for a long time, so from. I, I, when I was when I was like 17, mm -hmm. I was teaching at the Long Island Drum Center, and it was a really amazing um, venue at that point. It was they took teaching and education so seriously. I mean, we had these drummers on the staff there. I mean, we had we had um, Bobby Rondinelli, Jim Chapin, Dom Famularo. We had um, Rod Morgenstein. 
Um, I mean, the amount of insane players that were teaching. We'd have meetings once a week to get better in teaching, and, and it, was a, it was an amazing experience. So I love teaching. I've been doing it for my whole life. I still love it. Um, but what I want to do more is I, I, do, I, I just still do a little bit of everything still. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I still have private students. I love the clinics. The clinics for me are amazing because I can really connect with everybody. Meet new and, people, yeah. Yeah, the drummers and, and teaching, and I've been lucky. I've been all over the world doing that. It's been unbelievable. And then, you know, I've played in all kinds of bands my whole life and touring and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, so for me, it's, it's never been like one or the other thing. It's been mm -hmm. really everything. And, and, and But what I've done in, in the last, you know, while is I definitely fine-tuned to, to try to push it towards things I really, really love. So the teaching and clinics are happening. My own fusion band is amazing. Mm -hmm. I've been playing with a lot of New York City alternative rock bands, some young guys all over Brooklyn and New York City, a band named Robbers, um, Cosmic Harvey, Celestial Mind. There's a band called More Than Skies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love getting out and doing all this stuff. And, and to answer your question, oh, yeah, we all want to be the rock star, right? Come on. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, we, we, you know, you could be at the Blue Note playing, which I've played the Blue Note many times, or you can be at Madison Square Garden. I, I think you might want to be at Madison Square Garden, right? I mean, exactly. You know. if, if, you had any, <laughs> if you had any chance a couple of years ago to be in Red Hot Chili Peppers, I think you'd choose that. There you go. There you go. There you go. Right, so yeah. what um what what started it f first for you was it you know being in the band or did you actually make the decision to be like a, a teaching lessons and a, and a drum instructor what started it first because I know a lot of people when I hear it it's like oh I really wanted to do the band thing but then it kind of became more realistic to be you know I, I still wanted to do drums so I went the clinician route and and teaching lessons what what did that how it worked for you in the beginning or. Well, no, because it's interesting. When I came up, the scene was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. There was so much going on. So I didn't have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. I, I was making That's great. a living. Play, like When I came up, I was doing four or five weddings on the weekends, right? Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. The bands were, were really good. We had a full three or four-piece horn section. We were playing Tower of Power tunes. I mean, it was a really high-end, top-of-the-line musicians playing weddings to make a living. Mm -hmm. And then during the week... I would play in, in black clubs all over Long Island jazz. I mean, I got my first jazz experience playing all these black clubs on Long Island. It was amazing. I was playing like the Butterfly, all these Herbie Hancock and all these old jazz funk standards. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I would play with my own band during the week in a club. Then I'd play with different artists. I'd be doing recording sessions, a big band. I'd be doing um, radio gigs. I mean, it was like there was never – I never had to choose. There was mm -hmm. so much going on. But the thing was – we were lucky that we had the weddings so many, like a hundred, I did 120 a year, a hundred yeah. a year. And you they pay I mean? very so, well. And they pay great. So that was really sustaining me, helping me go so I can play all kinds of music that might be a little bit different or avant-garde. Mm -hmm. And then I'd be doing um, the teaching thing at the same time at the Long Island Drum Center. Then I had my own studio going on. Mm -hmm. And then the clinic thing came in. So for me, it was always, I wanted to be a professional drummer. I love playing drums. And I want to go out and do whatever I had to do to make it my full-time job. So for me, it wasn't one or the other thing. It was just do everything you can do. And that's what I'm still doing mm -hmm. today. Just whatever comes in and whatever I want to do. And the goal is to kind of make it so you're doing gigs that you love, not gigs that you don't love just for money. So mm -hmm. for me, it's about let's make the most percentage of gigs that you just and, – and teaching all the good things you love to do. Mm -hmm. And if you got to do things that are okay for some, some money or whatever else, that's fine. But at the end of the day – it's it's not either or for me. I do everything. Yeah, that's that, that's amazing. I mean, nowadays uh, people just don't have that drive. It's just I, I kind of feel like people fall into that normal nine to five. You got to get that nine to five, and then and they struggle to either get out of it or they just kind of they settle. They kind of stay there. Yeah, well, it's harder now because I mean, I play like I mentioned to you. I'm playing with a lot of young guys mm -hmm. um, in the in the New York area, and they don't have the outlet to go out and really do the weddings and, and the club dates or the paid gigs. You know, I, I, I've done gigs on boats around New York City. I played, you know, dinner cruises with the best jazz players in New York City. We're playing jazz and people are eating and we're going on, we're on a boat going around the Statue of Liberty. I mean, <laughs> all these amazing things. The young guys, they, it, does, it doesn't really exist as much. You know, the DJs came in. There's so mm -hmm. much less. There's so many less um, weddings and different, you know, whatever you want to call money gig, money gigs to play. Mm -hmm. So they end up having their part time or full time jobs and doing the music on the side. So it's a little harder for them, mm -hmm. you know. And we had it different. Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, things have changed. I mean, even even with me now with um, teaching. I mean, there's so much free information on YouTube. Yeah. It's 
teaching is different. Like even my young, the young guys, you go, dude, why don't you go to a store and uh, like, you know, the bass player friend of mine, the guitar player, young guys, you know, go to a music store and do some teaching. There's not even that many teaching jobs anymore because everything's on YouTube. When I came up, I had no idea what these guys were doing. I had to go take lessons. Yeah. <laughs> so it's different. It's different. You know, it's, it's all good, but it's different. So for me, it's the same as it always has been. You do everything you possibly can. You really do. So yeah. now have you, with the way that the music industry is going, do you feel like, it, like, like you said, everything's on YouTube now? So do you feel the instructional DVDs and books and stuff, they're getting phased out by YouTube? Well, they are. Mm -hmm. Not are they. They are. Yeah. You know, it stinks because I'm one of those yeah, – I still – not as much anymore just because of money situation, but – I'm one of those people that I want to be a musician for a living, so I go out and, and support and buy the CDs of the bands that I really like. Mm -hmm. And I, I just feel another reason is to have the physical product. So the fact that they're not coming out with the instructional DVDs anymore, it's kind of disappointing because I like to, you know, have that physical copy and just to pop it in. And, uh, you know, the YouTube thing is great. I love having it at my fingertips, but at the same time, you still like that, buying the physical product and, and popping it in. Yeah, me too. I mean, I have certain bands that I'm really a big fan of, a huge fan of, and I kind of like that because, you know, being in the industry as long as I've been, I know a lot of people and I've mm -hmm. met a lot of these big people and it's like, for me, it's just work. It's not a big deal, mm -hmm. but I still have some, you know, bands that I just kind of feel like a fan and mm -hmm. I really enjoy being a fan because usually I'm a colleague. Mm -hmm. So from when I'm a fan, I really like this band Switchfoot from San Diego, California. Oh it's yeah, called. with uh, the drummer from uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. No, no, that's that. That's chicken foot. Oh, chicken foot! Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, No, yeah, switch yeah. foot. Yeah, now, now yeah, I yeah, confuse yeah, the two. Foot, yeah, with um, yeah, that's with Sammy Hagar and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Chad Smith. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. this is switch foot. They've they've been around for a long time. Yeah, they're they're, they're a very popular radio band, actually. Yeah, now they, I, think about I, I just I just love the guys. Every time mm -hmm. they play, I go see them. I say hello, and I'm like, I'm, I'm a fan. I really mm -hmm. like being a fan. It's fun to be a fan, you know. But yeah. but so I buy every record they come. I always buy the hard copies and all that kind of stuff, and I. All my friends that put out instructional drum DVDs, I try to buy the actual hard copy, but it, it's it's getting less and less. So mm -hmm. that's just the way it is, and and that's just that, and that's a reality. So you got to just kind of go with that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what would you? Which drummer out there today do you say? Not not necessarily is the best drummer, but which mm -hmm. drummer out there today you, you look up to and say, "Wow, you know, I really need to practice more to get to his level." Which is the drummer out there for you? Well, there's, there's, there's two. There's, well, not two, but there's two kind of um, vibes. Mm -hmm. So, like, of course, my ultimate guy that I'm always learning from and, and listening to and, and blown away by is Vinny Kalayuda. I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's just, a, no, a name I know from Joe. Yeah, it's, it's just a no-brainer, you know. <laughs> just, he's, so, he's so far ahead in his, in, in his level that it's amazing to hear what he does and his mm -hmm. phrasing and learning from him all the time. But then on the other end of the thing, I've been doing a lot of this straight up alternative rock gigs around town as far as even some singer songwriter stuff. And man, when, you know, it, I've been doing it now for like four or five years for a while, I was just doing fusion, 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 mm -hmm. all this stuff. And I really am into this, just the pocket playing. And you know, it, it takes a while to kind of digest that thing when you're playing all the fusion music, because the fusion stuff kind of, it kind of sits at a different um, beats per minute. It's a certain vibe in that in that thing. Mm -hmm. The notes the notes flow in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Once you start playing in like a singer songwriter or even like a John Mayer thing with Steve Jordan on drums, yeah. that's that's deep stuff. Mm -hmm. So I've been I've been loving that and like sitting back and working on just really working on groove mm -hmm. and simple. I mean, playing simple slow grooves is challenging. And you mm -hmm. know, and so that has been amazing. And I was really fortunate. I just did a, a CD last year. It's coming out now. And it's just singer-songwriter, alternative, like really groove, very, very simple, slower temples. Um, it's called um, Cosmic Harvey and Celestial Mind. That's going to come out. And that's a really cool record, Ben. I played on it. People are going to be really cool to hear what I did because it's so different than all the stuff that I've recorded before. So, so I go back and forth to answer your question. I, I kind of love these guys that I'm learning from and transcribing. They're playing insane stuff. And then some of the guys like Sean Pelton, you know, just guys that just lay down these – beautiful grooves and just like how does that work like how does that <laughs> you know, how does that sit so well even even mark shulman from farna and from pink you hear him play he just puts that beat in a certain spot you know yeah. and rich, rich redman from uh, jason aldean's band you hear those right he's he's a good friend of mine mm -hmm. he he puts that groove it's so simple but you're like man how the hell do you do that you know mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's it's funny. I always talk to drummers about uh, Led Zeppelin. And yeah. W- when uh, John Bonham plays, it's, you hear like a cover of it, and you know everyone can obviously play it. A lot of people can play his music, but that that behind the beat feeling that he gets, it's just it's yeah. very hard to emulate. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I know some of the newer guys that play that well that way, mm-hmm. and I talk to them, and, and they work on it. Mm-hmm. I think I think John Bonham just had that. Yeah. You know? It, but you, you you can work on it. You can work with the click, and you can really be aware of you know playing behind the beat and and making it feel really comfortable, which is cool. But mm-hmm. I don't think he really he just that's just the way he was. That's, yeah, th- he had that like that that maybe slower, laid back kind of feeling to it that yeah that he just made it you know put into it. Um, so so real quick, let's go back to the the book that you have out, the elements. What um. For, for people that don't know, like myself, describe like what it goes over and what makes it different from like other you know books out there. Oh man, thanks for asking, Dan. Yeah, no, this no is problem. this is this has been an amazing thing for me. You know, um, through all my teaching and all my clinics, I base and also all my own practicing, I came up with, the, with this concept. It's a real conceptual thing. Mm-hmm. It the book is called the Elements, like you said, and what it really is is. Actually, I can just explain why it came out really quickly. Sure. I had I had all these students coming to me, and they all would come into the lesson, and I say, "Hey, nice to see you." And I always ask them, "Okay, you know, I I kind of see what they wanted to go over, but I always say, okay, let me look at your hand technique and your feet technique to start to see where you how you're approaching it because techniques a very important part mm-hmm. of the game, right?" And like ninety percent of the drummers, they had amazing hand technique and amazing feet technique, and I was like, "Wow." Fantastic. They were really sounding good. Everything looked good, sounded good. Their their technique was was relaxed, strong. And then when I said, okay, let's play the drums for a second. So they go to the drum set and they were a different player. Mm-hmm. So on like a pad or like the, the bass drum pads, as, as far as technique went, these guys were like g- girls and guys. They were at like an eight or on a scale from one to 10. They were really awesome. And they went over to the drum set. They were like a three. They weren't using the technique. They didn't know how to mm-hmm. use it. Like they had, they were working on technique, and then when they, they then they went to play the drums, they weren't they weren't bridging the gap between hand and feet technique and full drum set playing. Wow! So that's where the the elements came about. The elements is about connecting all your musical thoughts in your head with the technique you have. Hmm. And so, in other words, you can have insane technique, but if you can't know how to put it in a form or to four four or being able to play it within a form like three bars of time one bar fill or being able to solo with it and make sense out of all the technique you have you really it's only one part of the equation Mm -hmm. so the elements book was basically to take to bridge the gap between all the technique you have and and playing real musical solos and grooves on the drum set Mm -hmm. and so i Built this whole technique that really made you be able to, and again, it's it's a lot of it is up in your head and counting, connecting all that mental stuff with with the actual physical stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder if that has anything to do. I watched a, a video a while ago from uh, Mike Johnston, and he mm-hmm. said he said it amazes me because he he would give the stick to like maybe someone that hasn't really played drums as much, or you know maybe like a newer beginner drummer, and say you know play as fast as you can with like one hand. Mm-hmm. And he said he he was blown away because these people, they would just go crazy with the you know and and just beat away. And he's like, man, they're actually like really close to playing as fast as I as as I could. Yeah. But then if you told them to play a double paradiddle or a paradiddle, it would be nowhere near his level. And he and he said it kind of, it comes down to your brain and like the the memorization. So that if you're trying to play a paradiddle extremely fast, it's not try to play it as fast as you can. It's you need to play it as slow as possible because your brain basically needs to figure out how to play that fast. Do you feel like that maybe has something to do with why they're able to play it on a pad and then when they go to the set, it's not in the same, you know, uh, as, at the same level as when they were on the pad? Exactly. It's about matching that technique with, with your thoughts and it's about control. You know, paradiddles, you can play them fast, but you have to control them. And if you mm-hmm. control, it's about, you know, speed, endurance, control, and power. You know, you need all those different um, uh, vibes in, in your playing. And, and what happens is they have, they all want to have, you know, the good hand technique. And everybody, of course, when you first start playing, you want to play fast, all mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But if you only play fast on one surface and you can't bring it onto the drums, and even, even if you can play fast on the drums, you, you have to know how to count things and subdivide things. So mm-hmm. the elements are really just all the different breakdowns and subdivisions of the notes. Mm-hmm. So it's really simple. I mean, you, know, you have eighth note elements. 
triplets, you know, and then you have 16th notes. And my elements are like every 15 different subdivisions of the 16th notes, the different eighth notes. And once you master them and know how to count them and also count them out loud and mm -hmm. really internalize how they all go to the click track, it's the basic foundation of being able to play on a full drum set mm -hmm. in time, in the form, and use all that technique that you had. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something that the book has been amazing. I mean, the book has a lot of different conceptual things to it. There's big band playing, you're playing to hits, there's play along tracks, there's transcriptions. But the, the gist of the book is really to, to basically bridge the gap between all the technique you have, and then at that level, bring in your drum set, the four way coordination up to the same level. Mm -hmm. And be able to speak. Because how many times have you seen a guy that, or a student of yourself, right, who's, they have such amazing technique on one surface, but when you go, okay, play, give me, give me four bars of time and a four bar fill, and they fall apart. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. so, so they might have amazing technique, and they can play every single rudiment really great, and they have great half strokes, full strokes, and the technique is just great, hands and feet, but there's a whole other level of being able to apply that to the full drum set to mm -hmm. speak in a musical form, really musical form. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the exact same reason when, when someone's really good at playing the snare drum and marching band, and then they... Yes. You, you would think, it's so funny, you would think it would trans, translate over immediately to the drum set, but it's not quite the same for, for a lot of people. 100%. Mm -hmm. One, that's exactly correct. You get these guys that can play insane rudimental solos, and they get to the drums, and it's just, I don't know what it is. So mm -hmm. you have to have a, con a conceptual way of thinking to be able to take all that and put it on a full drum set, but not only just making the, the, the uh, transition from a snare drum, one, a one surface playing mm -hmm. to a full drum set with all the different coordination, but also having your, your counting abilities and your um, knowledge of music to be able to count those things and put them in musical form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So actually, where can, uh, where, where can people pick up the book? Is it still in guitar centers or I, I yep. see that you sell them, it's sell it on your website. Yeah, my, well, not my website so much. I, basically, mm -hmm. you can go to Wisdom Media website, and I know it's uh, we sell a lot on AlfredMusic.com because that's one of the you know it's Wisdom Media publication distributor from Alfred Music, and then a lot of people that I tell to get the book before they take a lesson from me go to Amazon.com. It's real simple to get it there. You know? Yeah, Amazon. Is, it seems like it's the best nowadays for buying basically anything. Anything. I, I have to. I'm going to buy something for my cat tomorrow on there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and as far as the the lessons go, do you you do both Skype and and in person, or is it only Skype? No, I do. It, I do. I do. You know, in my studio, home studio, I do Skype. Um, and at these days, I've been doing a lot of clinics too, which I told you I, I love it. You know, get to share all this information with a group of drummers is so much fun. Mm -hmm. And you, do you do any any type of uh, YouTube like promotion or any type of YouTube lessons stuff like that? You know, I have a, quite a bit of stuff on YouTube. Uh, my channel is uh, Drummer New York City, so it's like, um, you know, youtube.com slash drummer New York City, but you can go to my website at johnfav.com, J-O-H-N, F as in Frank, A-V as in Victor.com, and I have a link to my channel on YouTube. I have all my cool playing stuff from my bands and soloing, all my clinic stuff from all over the world, and I have some lessons on there too. Um, which is nice. I have some element lessons, some technique lessons. I try not to put too much lesson stuff on there because I want people to kind of come to me mm -hmm. where I can really sit with them and have the back and forth and really kind of, you know, I don't know, fine tune their playing when I can see them on the computer or in person, you know, mm -hmm. but I do have some lessons on there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and coming from someone who took lessons, it's, it's not selfish. It's really, I mean, you can get a lot out of, uh, some people can learn a lot, you know, from watching videos, but I really think that if you want to take it to the next level, you get a lot more benefit from taking the lesson in person just because someone's able to dissect and look over exactly what you're doing. So it's not selfish. It's it, There's a reason for it. Oh, no, no doubt. I mean, I, when, when I have guys, I just sit there and I can just, you know, there's so many little things. Now, the Skype thing's good. You you can see him on the Skype. Mm -hmm. But being, but being in, the same, in the same room, like I can see the guy's holding his, his elbow a little more. I'll tap his elbow, bring it in a little bit. Little things like that, mm -hmm. which, which make a big difference and just being there. But Skype is okay. I got, you know, the, the cool thing for me with the Skype lessons is most people that study with me on Skype have my drum book. Yeah. So it's really cool. It's very simple. Like I have my book here, they have the book there, whatever they may be in the world. And we just go over it and we're getting the whole thing and I can see them. That's a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and the fact that you can interact with people from halfway across the world. 
I know. I know. I have this guy in South Africa, this guy, Nicola. It's insane. You know, he's in South Africa. I'm in New York City, and we're just, like, doing our thing. It's, it's wild. <laughs> that's the, that's the, you know, that's funny. That's the third drummer we've had on here that has had a student from a Skype lesson in South Africa. I, I guess okay. that's, I mean, I, I know that they're big into, you know, the, the grooves that come from there are, are huge, but I, it, it just seems it's, it's funny to f that they pinpointed that location for Skype lessons. It must be a thing over there. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it, it's just, it, it blows, it's a, well, I know a lot of my friends went over there and they play um, the South African Jazz Festival. It's, it's called the Cape Town Festival and mm -hmm. it's an amazing festival. So they're into the, like the serious music and all that kind of stuff. And I, I guess that's why they have a good, a good healthy amount of musicians there, you know? Mm -hmm. So people can contact you for, for lessons uh, on your website and then also it's uh, drummrfave at aol.com. Is that the correct it, email? Exactly right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, where else can people interact with you? Uh, you have Facebook, Instagram, or uh, Twitter. Yeah, I got everything going. Of course, <laughs> I mean everything. <laughs> it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I like it. I like having the um, the face the Facebook thing going, the mm -hmm. Twitter, and and yeah, like you said, Instagram, and uh, yeah, and the YouTube channels is really fun. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right. So and then and so it, they basically just search by your name, John F uh, Favicia. Yep. Get All on right. there. My, my website's the easiest thing to remember. Really, everything. Will you know branch out from my website, which is johnfav.com. Simple. All right, great. So, and to end the episode, we like to end uh, with a song of yours. So, just any, it could be any song. Which, even if it's not from your band, what what song would you like to end the episode with? Um, so that I play on, like yeah. my records. Yeah. You, you're gonna play it. Do you have everything there? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, we uh, we usually get it from YouTube. Okay. So if there's something on YouTube, we like to put yeah, it at the end of yeah. the, the episode. Oh, that's cool. Let me think, man. I, there's so many tunes up there. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you check out, oh, man, you know, there's so many good stuff. I don't know. Well, everybody loves a song called Coincidence. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Coincidence. I have videos and just audio on, on YouTube there. Mm -hmm. um, the audio is really cool because it's, it's more studio sounding than the live video that I did mm -hmm. at the clinic. So, yeah, Coincidence. It's a great track. Welcome All right. All right. All yeah. right, great. So, uh, John, thanks for coming on the episode. It was it was great talking to you. And uh, so here's your song, Coincidence. Thanks, man. Thanks, Dan. Be well. You Talk too. To you soon. Cheers. Bye.